reflections for the sixth week of the Easter season. Our gospel is from the chapter 15 in John, verses 9 through 17, and our focus is the phrase, it was not you who chose me, but I who chose you. I am Tom Lehigh, your host for this, this evening. Let us begin our session tonight in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We would like to uh, ask everyone, uh, if you would uh, please mute your mics to reduce distracting sounds during the presentation and the recording. We appreciate that. We share these reflections each Wednesday night in anticipation of Sunday's gospel readings. If you have questions, you can post them in the chat area or send them to us by email at dd redudley at gmail.com. The first two parts of this meeting are being recorded and we'll make those recordings available on the parish website for those who might not be able to participate live. Look for the Gospel Reflections logo on our website and parish bulletin to find more resources. In part one, our team member, Barbara Stripmatter, will share a simple five-step Lexio Divina or praying with the word to encourage us all to try this form of praying with the Sunday gospel in preparation for Sunday mass. In part two, there will be a brief gospel reflection by Frank Hieropoli, highlighting our theme for this week for those who wish to stay. Finally, in part three, following that reflection, we will stop our recording, provide an opportunity for those who wish to stay to briefly share the word by sharing one word or brief point they found helpful and encouraging. Please stay for only those parts you wish to. Feel free to sign off at any time. So let us pray uh, that God may open our minds that we might hear God's word, our lips that we might proclaim it, and our hearts that we might. Our lecture tonight is uh, Joanne McCaffrey. And we're gonna play this right now. Uh, well, and I say that, but um, Harry, I don't have an arrow again this evening. Don't know what happened, it was there. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this has happened on, I don't know, maybe it's something to do with my computer, but uh, you know, Ever since uh, I had that one occurrence, I, I always come pretty prepared. So I'm <laughs> <We're> ready. <laughs> the scripture open tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and read that if that's all right with everyone. So, as the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my commandment. Love one another as I love you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if I do what I command you. I no longer call you slaves because a slave does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. It was not you who chose me, but I who chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will remain so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give you. This I command you, love one another. The word of the Lord. Okay. okay, thank you. There are many themes and phrases upon which we can focus. This week we have chosen to focus on the words, it was you who chose me. It was not you who chose me, but I who chose you. Being chosen for a team event was always nerve-wracking to me. As I stood in the lineup, I worried. Am I popular enough to be picked? Am I good enough? Oh, what if I'm the last one picked? 
During my high school years, this was pretty important to me. But in reality, I had already been handpicked by the greatest team captain in the whole universe. I have been chosen by God to be shepherded by his son, Jesus. He didn't choose me because of anything I did. He chose me simply because he loves me. God wasn't the only one to make a decision. I had to make a decision as well. And I responded to his love by saying yes. However, I cannot just relish in his love. I have work to do that was put into place before I was even born. What an amazing thought that is. My first priority is to love and praise God, but I also need to spread the good news about his son. It is my mission given to me by Jesus to tell everyone about his saving grace. Just think, I have been chosen, not because I was the most popular, not because I was the most athletic or the most intelligent. Thank you, God, for choosing me. What can I say to the Lord in response to his word? Dear kind and generous Father, thank you so much for loving me and choosing me to be a disciple of Jesus. Knowing that I am one of your chosen ones fills me with gratitude, confidence, and a desire to do your will. Because I've been chosen by you, it is up to me to continue your work here on earth. I know that my mission is to go make lasting believers, a task I am ready to accept, and I ask for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to carry out this work. Now we will spend quiet time in God's presence. I am going to share what action my contemplation led me to consider. Please remember that each of us will find that our actions will be very particular to what God is calling us to do. Evangelization, evangelization is growing in our church community because of the hard work of several individuals and the timing is perfect. It began as a phone ministry during the pandemic, and the phone ministry is now morphing into a true evangelization ministry, and we will be walking the streets and visiting lost sheep from the parish, parish at their homes. I, for one, can't wait to be involved. 
this is something that I've always been passionate about and I can't wait to do God's work. Thank you. Tom, you're muted. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, Barb, that was great. Thank you. And we Barb for uh, modeling up for us the five steps of Lexio Divina this week. We hope this encourages us to use the reflection sheet provided on page six of our parish bulletin and on the parish website to try our own Lectio Divina each week to help prepare for Sunday Mass. We invite those who wish to stay as we now transition into part two, the gospel study reflection. Thank you, Tommy. <clears throat> as we continue with tonight's um, gospel reflection, I'd like to remind us that we are, uh, it's a continuation in chapter 15, uh, which was last week's gospel reflection, the first eight verses. So obviously there's a, a direct connection between tonight's reading and last week's. Uh, I'd also like to remind us that we're in chapter 15, which means we're also in Jesus's Last Supper discourse, where he's uh, giving to his disciples uh, his last statement regarding a farewell address. So this all comes into play, and those chapters of this last discourse went from chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, which by far is the longest statement in any of the four Gospels uh, at the Last Supper. So as we begin uh, our reading, I'd like to point out that last week we had a parable about the vine and the branches, and that we, uh, we established that bearing fruit was symbolic of possessing divine life. And then we also added that uh, it also inv involves the communication of that divine life to others. And this is what Jesus meant by bearing fruit. So tonight's reading is going to reflect upon that and further define what was stated in the uh, vine and the branches from last week. Uh, we also wanted to uh, read at the verse eight, excuse me, verse eight, okay, which is the ending of last week's reading. It says, by this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Okay, so we have to decide what does that mean to become Jesus' disciples, okay? And in this reading tonight, we clearly get it defined. In verses 9 to 10, becoming Jesus' disciple means the love of Jesus. And then in verses 12 to 17, which ends our reading, we're told that we must love one another. And then to put the accent on that, we are also told that there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for your fellow disciple. So this is all going to be now tied in together. Last week's reading and our reading tonight, talking about love and the tying of bearing, bearing of fruit. So verses 9 to 17 with the theme of love are really is an interpretation of the idea of bearing fruit. Although the imagery of the vine and the branches occurs only in verse 16, the whole of 9 through 17 really is very much related to the imagery of the vine and the branches. If we were to go a little bit early in John's gospel in chapter 6, which is his multiplication of loaves, we heard that life was passed from the Father to the Son so that the Son could pass on and commun communicate life to others. Now, in our reading, in verse 9, we are told that love also is to be passed on. And this is fitting because, if you don't mind, I would like to explain uh, in, verse, in chapter 13, at the very beginning of chapter 13, okay, I want us to listen to how John begins and discusses this concept of love. He says, before the Feast of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to pass from this world to the Father. He loved his own in this world, and he loved them to the end. So that, that gives us the setting. That at, the, at the beginning of this discourse, it, John tells us about how much Jesus loved his own. And now this whole chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 is going to describe how much Jesus loves us and in the various imageries that he uses, okay? But this interchangeability between life and love, it cautions us against 
thinking that by love, Jean means, Jesus means something primarily emotional. Because for John, love is related to being and remaining in Jesus. The last line of verse 9 says, remain in my love, which puts a demand on us to respond to Jesus' love for, for us. So we are demanded to respond to Jesus' love for us. And this is what John is telling us. In verse 10, it associates the love and a commandment. Commandment obviously means obedience. So you have love and obedience, which are mutually dependent. Love arises out of obedience, and obedience arises out of love. In verse 11, we are told that joy is presented as flowing from obedience and love, which Jesus has spoken of. And Jesus' own joy springs from his union with, with the Father, which finds expression in his obedience and in his love. The obedience and love to which in turn Jesus calls his disciples both constitutes and witnesses to their union with him. It is this union that will be the source, source of their joy. If joy flows from the disciples' union with Jesus, it comes to fulfillment in their continuing his mission and bearing fruit. In verse 10, Jesus has said that they would remain in his love if they kept his commandments. Now the disciples are told that the basic commandment of all of the commandments is love. Love can subsist only if it produces more love. In verses 9 and 12, there is a chain of love. The Father loves Jesus, Jesus loves his disciples, and the disciples are called to love one another. The model of the disciples' love is Jesus' supreme act of laying down his life for each other, for, for us. And this type of love reflects the intensity of the disciples' love and the way of expressing their love, because we too are called to lay down our lives. If we take verses 12 and 13 together in its expanded sense, they become one of the great justifications for Christian martyrs. And this is where this concept of laying down our life, and, and we've had Christian martyrs to this very day. In verse 14 refers to the beloved of Jesus who really constitute all Christian believers in all time, not just in John's age, but Christians for all time and all ages. The Christian remains a servant, in Greek a doulos, okay, from the viewpoint of service that he should render, but the true meaning, okay, comes from the viewpoint of intimacy with God, okay, uh, which is more than just being God's doulos. We gain, when we have this intimacy of love with God and Jesus, then we certainly surpass being a servant. And Jesus' act of love and dying for his disciples has made them his beloved. So he can call us his beloved. The, cons the uh, con constitution of the disciples as his beloved is part of their election by Jesus. Jesus is addressing himself to all Christians who are the elect or chosen by God. We hear this in the letter to the Romans and to the letter to the Colossians. Here for John, the 12 who were the most intimate disciples of Jesus are the models for all Christians, both in their having been chosen or elected and also because they were sent out, okay, to bear fruit. In verse 16, by stressing that the fruit that they bear must remain, John uses an inclusion to last week's story in verses seven and eight and brings back the prominent vocabulary of the vine and the branches. The theme of asking and having it granted at the end of verse 16 also is an inclusion with last week's reading. It gives assurance that God will hear Jesus' chosen and loved ones, and they are commissioned by Jesus, and so they can make their petition in Jesus' name. And then our reading concludes with the love uh, of, for a loved one for, of each other, because it's fitting, because the whole section is about love. But what John has done very cl uh, cleverly, if we will note, at the end of verse 17, where it says that we are to love one another in verse 18 of uh, chapter 15. He, John will go on and now tell us about if the world hates you, realize that it hated me first. So in, in the continuation of chapter 15 is there clearly to show us that how much God and Jesus 
offers love to us, but the world will offer hatred. And this is what we're to take away from our reading tonight. How lucky we are to be Jesus's beloved. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Mm -hmm. We have time for a quick question for Frank. Try to focus on a question that will help us all better appreciate the meaning of the gospel. You can also submit your questions, comments, or suggestions for improving our sharing by emailing them to us at ddredudley at gmail.com. These sessions are getting better. It's because of all the helpful suggestions we receive. Thanks for all that have sent suggestions so far. Is there anybody that has a quick question for Frank? I do. Okay. Frankie, in verse 18, if the world hates you, realize that it hated me first. Mm -hmm. You belong to the world. The world would love its own and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yes. And to me, I think there's somewhere further back that he talks about knowing us before creation. Yes. So if are we to reflect on that in a sense of kind of a predestination that you know, which, which we as Catholics do not usually subscribe to. But in, in a way, is this intimating some predestination for us? Uh, Chuck, I would, I would again go with no on that, Chuck. I would go yeah. no with the predestination of that, Chuck. It, it's the, the fact that God knows everything doesn't mean that God necessarily manipulates history or us in a fashion that takes away our free will. Okay, what I think is being intimated, what is being intimated is that uh, God from his, his, uh, his uh, ability to know everything simply is aware of who's going to believe in him and who isn't. Okay, but I think the point, Chuck, more so that is being made, and this is a point that our Catholic Church has often uh, held up, is that we may, yes, we may live within this world, but we're really not of this world meaning of belonging to God. We belong to God, and yes, we live in this world, but our real destination is with God, not in this world, okay? So I think what John is trying to do is draw the distinction between those who are comfortable living outside of Jesus and outside of God, the only place they can reside is the world, okay? Whereas, Whereas, because we share Jesus' divine life now, because he's going to give us his spirit, because we share divine life, our existence is with God in the other realm, okay? So we're in the world, but not of the world, okay? And the others who remain in this world without Jesus, okay, then their emotion is the opposite of love, if we could say that, and it's that of hatred. So I think that that's the point that's being made, Chuck, more than, than uh, necessarily the pre-existent knowledge that Jesus would have as the word made flesh. But I know what you're saying, Chuck, and it's a very good point. Your point is well made. But that, that knowledge uh, that comes out of the prologue of John's gospel uh, is, I think, meant to tell us something different. Okay, but may I ask another thing? Absolutely. Here, here at verse 15. I no mm -hmm. longer call you slaves and so forth. Yes. I've called you friends because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. Could you expand on that a bit? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. In the Old Testament, Chuck, in the Old Testament, uh, the prophets often referred to themselves as servants, okay, or slaves. The Greek word that's being used is doulos, okay? And that word connotes both servant and slave. Interestingly, Mary uses it in Luke's gospel when Gabriel appears and she says to him, I am the maid, handmaiden of, of the Lord. She is really saying, I am the doulos of the Lord. I am the slave of the Lord. Okay, so the Old Testament gives us that, that background and there's multiple examples in the Old Testament and in the New okay, well, as I pointed out with Mary, that that word can certainly constitutes, okay, the idea of being the God's servant. But here, I think the important part, what Jesus is saying, okay, that if indeed we live our life and bear fruit, okay, in him, 
then we, we go beyond being a servant. We go beyond being the slave or the doulos, and we become his beloved, okay? And as we well know, Jesus in John, John, in John's gospel, and certainly in the Jonine writings, and particularly the first letter of John, will state that God is love. So that's part of our identification of, of sharing divine life. This idea that we're beloved by God and we're in God, in Jesus, and we bear the fruit of love, okay? And by bearing the fruit of love, that means we're a witness to Jesus. So that is a much stronger expression, but it doesn't obviate. You're correct in saying, Chuck, it doesn't obviate the fact that we are still servants or slaves to God. We work, you know, we work in an effort uh, to serve God. We are servants of God. Yes, that's true. But our, our potential is much, much higher, okay? Because we become, we're in a love relationship with God. And for John's gospel, that is as high as it can be. Because that's what the Father and the Son share, is a love relationship. I and appreciate that. that. I yeah, appreciate but, that, Frankie. But what I'm concerned is what, what he talked about telling us everything. Ah, uh, well, Chuck, that's a good point, okay? Because in John's gospel, okay, you're, you're going to have that aspect. In John's gospel, we, we are told, okay, that Jesus only could share with us what he heard when he was preexistent with the Father. So when he's telling us everything, I believe, Chuck, that's an expression that says he's telling us everything we need for our salvation, Everything we need for our salvation, Jesus has shared in his ministry. And then he's going to tell us, by the sending of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will only, only testify to what Jesus has said and what he has shared with us. The Holy Spirit won't add to that. The Holy Spirit will confirm everything that Jesus has said and lead his church in unity with what Jesus has said. But that does come from Jesus' pre-existent relationship with the Father. And so that's why Jesus can say he shared everything with us because of his pre-existence. Does that make sense? But it's everything that we need to know related to our salvation. Yes, and, and, and the big word out of that whole, all of those verses, of course, is very simply, all he wants us to do is love one another. Exactly. That's the, one, that's the one overarching command in John's gospel. Right. Now, if we were in the synoptic right. gospels, it would be a little bit different. But in John's gospel, the overarching commandment, and actually the, the one that matters from, from John's point of view, is that the commandment of love one another. Right. And the example is that that love can be so extreme and so radical that you could even lay your life down. Okay, and if you don't mind me making a quick statement, that statement about sacrificing your life for another, for another one of your fellow Christians, that becomes the major, one of the major dividing theological points between Judaism of Jesus's time and the Judaism even of today, where the Judaism of uh, then and today won't necessarily say they're commanded to give up their life for one another, okay? They're, they're, they're commanded to love one another, they're commanded to take care of one another, but they're not commanded to give up their life for one another. Jesus is commanding, commanding us, okay, in a way that if it's necessary, we have to give up our life for one another, okay? It's, so there's a huge difference in the radical uh, statement made by Jesus in John's gospel. Okay, and Thank it, you, Frank. It, it, yeah, it separates itself from the Judaism of Jesus's time, and the Judaism of today. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Chuck. Thank you for the questions. Very good. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. And then uh, basically, you know, our goal here is to grow an understanding of God's word and his promises, build hope, faith, and trust in our Lord, and share how we try to apply it to God's word, God's word to our lives. Please pray for this effort to better understand and encounter Christ through the scriptures. Please also help us to spread the word about this. Special thanks to Brenda Costell, our music director for the parish, for sharing our music tonight. Information about the piece is listed here. They'll know we are Christians by our love. 
Music by Peter Schultes, arranged by Mark Hayes. Brenda always does a great job with that music. Thank you, Brenda. Okay, so shortly we will stop the recording. This part three is our time to share the word. This is not a time to teach or study God's word, but rather inspire and encourage one another. Our focus tonight, John 15, 9 through 17, it was not you who chose me, but I who chose you. Again, this part three is for those who wish to stay and share faith, hope, and encouragement. Thank you and God bless for those who may need to leave now while we again briefly share the music before stopping the recording.